introduction at all. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, thanks for coming. It's quite incredible. I think I've never, maybe only in university I've talked to so many people. Um, so, a little bit about myself. Um, I did quite a lot of things. Um, I'm a professional athlete in the past. I went to music school and um, I'm originally from Moscow, um, where I grew up and studied film production. I also worked on national television there. And when I moved here, I started working with culture and advertising. And um, one thing, when Sandra invited me to talk about the flow, and I was like thinking, okay, so what is, what is the first association I have with the flow? And the first association I have with the flow is, um, is water. Um, maybe because I was born into water, my parents had a little bit of alternative. I was not born in a normal um, hospital like normal people do. I was born in a pool. <laughs> and um, some my parents argue that this is because I have this very, you know, calling for big water or something. So apart from all of my work um, activities and everything, uh, one of my big passions is um, surfing. And uh, why do I want to talk about surfing? I want to give you an example of something that would seem impossible 20 or 30 years ago. So surfing is a very old sport. It comes from Polynesian cultures. And in surfing, the last sort of 20 years were very, very productive. And until 1996, there was very little progress. So the tallest surfable wave was around 7.5 meters. And all of the papers and the magazines about surfing or everyone, doctors will say how it is impossible to paddle up to anything taller than 7.5 meters. I mean, 7 meters is already quite high. Um, the point is that uh, since the 90s, um, people paddled or jet ski to waves like this. <laughs> and um, so in contemporary art where I work now, Every time I go to Venice Biennale and see all of those fantastic exhibitions, I'm always asking myself, how did they even come up with this thing? What is, how is this even possible? And um, if you take music, for example, I mean, we all have opera here, and um, I'm always fascinated by composers. Imagine you have to compose a piece for 100 different people, 100 different instruments that it makes sense together. I have no idea how they do it. For me, it seems impossible. Um, but people do it regularly, people do it every day. Uh, not only musicians and uh, professional athletes, we also see it in business. In the last 50 years, in business and startups, there's so many new professions. Most of you probably can't even describe to your grandparents what you do for a living. And <laughs> um, there's all sorts of growth hacking and personal hacking and all of that. And small teams, like Uber or any other startups are reshaping the whole industries. What does it take to do that though? Uh, sorry. <laughs> so, one thing I learned was trying so many different things, music, sport, uh, in professional lives. I also tried so many different careers from being a producer, to being a reporter, to being a photographer, to being a, a filmmaker, um, and now I'm doing PR. Um, so what I learned was that it doesn't matter really what you do. What matters is how you do it and what attitude you have towards it. And um, what researchers saw when they studied a bunch of successful people, a bunch of entrepreneurs, or people who are just very, very, very innovative, is that they all have the state of mind that they describe as flow. And what is flow? It's just state when you feel your best and when you perform your best. And um, there's a technical term, and uh, the flow science comes from 1880s and starts with Einstein. Um, the person who kind of tapped into it a little bit more was a person with the impossible surname, Mihai Tixen Mihai. Uh, and in the 60s, 70s, uh, he was a professor at the University of Chicago. And what he did is he basically tapped into a research probably the biggest research on optimal performance ever done. And he studied. Um, what is it the state that everyone describes? How, how would you describe it? And what is flow? Why is it called flow? What it actually is? And um, things that he discovered... Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, were pretty um, cool. And the three most important things are 
is that uh, flow is uh, definable and measurable. And you can define flow by uh, seven core characteristics. characteristics. Um, uh, three of them, the most important ones being uninterrupted concentration, vanishing of self, and time dilation. And time dilation is something um, you probably all know this, you know, there's some points of your life, it can be also just unpacking, I was just helping Anna yesterday, uh, when you lose the sense of time, it can be very slow motion, if there are any filmmakers out there you know, it's like 120 frames per second and things seem very, very slow, or it normally passes really fast, so you do something for five hours and it feels like five minutes and you're like, whoa, what happened? Um, Vanishing of self, I think you don't need to uh, explanation. And because it's definable, we can actually measure it. So what does it mean we can measure it? McKinsey did a study and they discovered that, uh, McKinsey always does studies, uh, they discovered that managers in a state of flow are 500 times more productive in a single day than any other regular sort of work ethics you would have. Um, and the last thing he discovered was that flow is fundamental. So it's not something you have or don't have, like we always think about talent or that person is talented and that person is not. It's fundamental, just like the exercise, we all have it inside. Um, the only thing we need is some conditions that have to be met and um, we can all get there. So, um, why flow is flowing? It's actually um, a very technical definition, so normally, if you ask anyone, you know, it can be called runner's high or uh, being in the zone or however you describe it. Normally, when we are in a flow, people describe it something like, you know, I just know what to do, I make the right decisions and one thing leads seamlessly to the last. So, that technical term is flowing, right? So you know what to do, the creativity is on top and when you're creative, what does it mean to be creative? It's taking new information, absorbing it, processing it, connecting it to the old information, creating something new, the product, the idea, or whatever it is. Um, the most important thing of flow, though, is that, um, and if you Google his name, uh, you will see a lot, he talks about happiness, and he wrote a book about happiness, and basically what he said is that flow is essential for happiness. People. The happiest people from his research of optimal performance were the ones that have the most flow present. So, sorry. Yeah. So, interestingly, we would like to know where the flow is coming from. So thanks to the recent obsession of everyone with meditation, neuroscience, and all sorts of research, um, we actually are able to see what's happening to the brain where we are in this most productive state. And um, the all ideas of um, the way brain works um, is this idea that we are only using 10% or 3% of our brain. Who still thinks that it's the case? No? <laughs> At least one person. I always thought so, I always was saying, you know, we're not using the brain to the full potential, we should do this, do this. So, the idea that I had when I started reading into this is that, okay, so if we're only using the brain to 10%, probably in the flow or in the high performance, we're using the brain to full capacity. No. <laughs> I had it all wrong. So it turns out, in the flow, um, we actually use less of the brain. So this old idea that more is more is kind of old, and this is what Sandra was talking about. We have so much information, and it's very difficult to process. Basically, we're now operating, imagine our brain is more like a computer with 100 tabs open, and it's just going, freezing all the time, and we can't process it. So what happens in the flow is um, described as transient, meaning temporary, hyperfrontality, and hyper is less, and frontality is the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex is the most, one of the most important part of the brain. Um, it's responsible for strategic decision making, planning, the way we feel ourselves, the way we feel time. And um, what happens in flow is that the part of the brain is kind of freezes. Our brain is trading that energy for focus. And um, what happens when we can't be, feeling, when we don't feel the future or the past anymore. 
Uh, basically what happens is that we enter in the sense that research is called the, the deep now. And what happens in the deep now is that um, normally anxieties or fears or any sort of those destructive thoughts, they're either horrible things that happened in the past with us and we don't want to go back, or they're the things that we're really afraid of, so we would like to avoid them. When you're in the deep now, you concentrate on what is right there and all of that anxiety and stress kind of is in the other one. Um, and another important thing that happens when the prefrontal cortex is kind of frozen is that the feeling of self um, is also a little bit blocked. And why is it helpful is because um, that inner critic, you know, that Woody Allen thoughts, nagging and being like, no, you can't do that, you're not good enough, it also falls asleep. So the risk taking goes higher, the creativity goes up, and you're not no, no longer doubting your ideas, so you can be way more, you're basically literally getting out of your way. And pretty great, right? <laughs> Last thing is that um, in the flow, our brain produces the most um, important five uh, neurochemicals at once. Those are the important ones. I think we all heard a lot about dopamine and serotonin, and I saw that there's a drink that has two of them. <laughs> <laughs> let's, see, let's see if that works. So, enough of that. You're probably all thinking, okay, great, flow is amazing. How do we get there? Flow is hackable. And by the way, just a little side note, the pictures, all the pictures apart from the pictures of me chasing me high and the big wave are my pictures. I'm, I'm also a photographer. Just, it's a bit random, so just so you know, there's no, I didn't take them from the internet. <laughs> um, so, flow is hackable. Um, as I said, it's not something that you either have or don't have. Um, there are certain conditions that, that can be met and have to be met. The most important one uh, being focus. Flow always follows focus, so uh, probably the most important one is uninterrupted com concentration as well. And um, here's the high performance toolkit. <laughs> um, and uh, there are individual triggers for the flow and group triggers for the flow. It's not just you who can be in the flow, it can also be a group. We all experience those beautiful brainstorms where things are just working out, or I don't know, we also this groundbreaking um, basketball games or football games where the winning seems impossible, but then something happens and the team is sort of like on the, on the high. And um, I mean, it's all very personal and of course with individual triggers, whatever you choose or whatever works for you would lead you to focus. So basically, the, 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 again, the main important thing of flow is focus. And those things, they will all basically lead you to be more focused or more attentive to what you're doing. We can go a little bit through this. I mean, with passion is quite clear. If you like something, if you're passionate about it, you're gonna just pay more attention to it. With risk, it's also quite easy. If you're on the top of the mountain, and you're probably not gonna check your phone for Instagram, right? So you're gonna watch really clearly where you step. Um, it's the same in work, it's the same in creative decision-making, it's the same in everything. So, whatever, whatever, drives your boat, novelty, complexity. We all, all of us have personal preferences. Um, I want to talk a little bit about group triggers because maybe this is something a little bit um, more complicated because there you're working with more people or even even if it's, when it's two people and it's relationships, it's already getting like kind of, okay, so I want to go there and I want to go there. And uh, uh, important thing is, for example, this, practice of saying yes. Um, I read it that uh, Amazon has a very uh, funny policy. So Jeff Bezos uh, made um, everyone use this policy. If you want to suggest something in uh, Amazon and you want to say no, that's a stupid idea, you can't just say that. Basically what you have to do is you have to write a paper uh, stating why you don't want to do that or why do you think it's a stupid idea. Submit it to the company website and then other people have to decide whether the idea will be uh, happening or not. I think it's pretty cool because especially if you work with creative industry or in the agency and then there's this very nasty creative director who's, I don't know, in a bad mood or didn't have coffee yet and we come all excited and say, let's do this, and it's like, no, that's stupid. So you basically go all the way from excitement down and it feels really bad. Um, all of the 
rest of the things are kind of um, obvious. Um, one thing uh, where we could also look and get inspired is Montessori education. And uh, what's interesting in Montessori education is that there's a lot of autonomy and why autonomy is important in the group. I mean, when you're driving a car, obviously you're gonna pay more attention to the road than when you're on a, on a taxi or somewhere on the side. Um, and I cannot stress this enough is concentration, uninterrupted concentration is still the most important thing. Getting to the next one. So basically now we're bombarded by 1,000 emails, uh, incoming messages, Slack, WhatsApp, Facebook, you name it. And that creates a lot of, I don't know, I'm getting really stressed about that. And then the first thing that I think sometimes in the morning, oh my God, I have to check my email. So in flow, you can't do that. So in order to be in a flow, you have to concentrate and you have to zone out every distraction that is out there, which is kind of preventing you from doing what you should be doing. Um, and it's all great. And I prepared it um, like a 10 pinpoints on um, how I personally get in the flow and how I work with this. And a uh, little disclaimer when I was invited for this talk, um, last, was it last week? <laughs> last week. Um, uh, I was super excited and then on the weekend I sat down to, to do the presentation and I was like, oh my god, I, I don't actually, I don't feel like it. Uh, it's a stupid idea. I'm so tired and exhausted. And I realized that I'm actually in nearly a burnout state because I just finished the fear uh, where I worked at Vienna Contemporary and I was traveling a lot this summer. And I was just really, really tired. And um, one thing I learned is that if it's not flowing, just let it go. You know, Don't try to force yourself, don't try to hack the state, don't try to make yourself be productive because if you're tired, you're tired. The first thing you have to do is restore you, your resources. There's no way around it. If you're not getting enough sleep, you're not gonna be productive. If you're not getting enough sleep, you cannot be in a flow physically. It's physically impossible. So the first hack of everything is get a very basic sleep hygiene fix, get a basic food hygiene fix, and then you can hack things. <laughs> So, and that goes to the first thing is, um, you have to prioritize what you feel and how you feel about yourself or with yourself. What it means is, um, you have to be very honest about your emotions. So, when you have the task, I mean, it doesn't mean that you don't have to do taxes, right? So, we all hate taxes. Um, what it means is that before you do taxes, you think, oh my god, I hate it, well, why do I have to do this again? It's horrible, it's stupid. You can also pay someone else to do it if it's really that bad. But basically, um, what it means is that what I do is I say, okay, I have to do taxes until Friday. I don't say, okay, today, now is the only day when I can do it. That also works, adrenaline helps. Uh, but you give yourself a time frame and then you see how you feel. If you wake up in the morning and you think, oh my, no, 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 not today. I mean, it can happen for months as well. I've been there. But um, just talk to yourself and listen to your inner thoughts, listen to your body and see, see don't, don't try to suppress those feelings. See where they're coming from, see, understand them. If you understand them, they actually normally let, let let you free and set yourself free. You can say, okay, I'm angry because I, I don't know, I'm anxious about money or I'm scared that the amount of taxes I, I have to pay is a bit higher than I expected. So those are my thoughts. And this is, once I realize I'm gonna write that down, it's like, okay, so what's gonna happen? I still have to do it. And what happens is that instead of spending five times more um, on taxes than you would, hating it and thinking, oh, you just get your shit together and you do it. Uh, the second one is uh, get a handle of what you desire and set clear goals. It's a very obvious one, and I always, when I read these things, I'm like, duh, okay, of course. But what I realize is that uh, very often you have desires that cancel each other, or very often you have something that you kind of know what you want, but then you're like, mm, do I really want that? Um, and in creative work, uh, very often you, you don't really, oh, that's funny because uh, there's actually a sculpture, but because it's... 
interesting. Um, so it's very important to know if you're productive to set what is it that you're actually aiming for. Because if you're doing some creative work and you don't really have a clear output, the clear output can also be I just want to do nothing or I just want to be in the flow and have thousands of ideas. That's also fine. It's just like as long as you define it, you can work with it. Um, fragmentation. So as I was telling you before, uh, fragmentation is a very important part of our life. We shouldn't suppress it, but it's also something, I want to fly a helicopter, but I'm afraid of heights. So probably you're not going to fly a helicopter or you're going to be dreaming about flying a helicopter, but you're never going to do it because you're actually afraid of heights. So what you need to do with it is you have to be very aware of what are those internal voices and what are those internal processes that you have. What are the beliefs that your parents gave you? You can't make money um, in four hours a day. You have to work really hard. And all of those things, their mind is stopping you from doing what you want. And basically it looks like you have four people in the boat and two people are pedaling towards front and two people are pedaling backwards. So you're kind of spinning around in the same place and then spinning around and spinning around and thinking, Fuck, where am I not getting anywhere? So you have to align and agree with yourself where you want to go and how you want to get there. Um, this one is a good one. <laughs> you know, the fish, it flies and it goes with the current and um, in our fast society, the most important thing to stay in the flow and not to be sort of sidetracked or not to be uh, kicked out of the flow, you have to be very quick and very adaptive. So. If um, a campaign that you work towards or a husband that you decided to marry or whatever is not working for you anymore, you have to act really quick because if you don't, you take the decision or you make the choice that will actually not service you. So don't be afraid to change those desires. Don't be afraid to change your mind. And it's totally normal and it's life. So it's not gonna, you know, it's not gonna be like you choose to go like this and then you just go like this. It's never working like that and you know that. That's me surfing. <laughs> that's okay. So, uh, yeah, so I'm sorry. That's fine. <laughs> Act fast inspiration. And I, inter um, I, I took my video because this is my biggest struggle and my biggest problem. I have thousands of ideas, but I always kind of cook with them. I think, okay, so what if I did this? And then what if I did that? And, 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 then, and then it never happens. I have a couple of friends who are entrepreneurs, and uh, Anna and Kaya are one of them. The difference between me and them is that when they have an idea, they just go and do it. So you have to act really fast when you have inspiration. And one thing I learned from surfing, and it doesn't matter, you don't have to surf, you can do whatever activity you want, but in surfing, you sit on a lineup and you wait for waves. And initially I got a little bit better so I could go there, so I was sitting there and I'm thinking, okay, so maybe this one is not good enough, and well, okay, that one is was but this, this guy took it, I should let him do it, he's more professional. And this one, well, I don't know, I don't feel like it. And then I was just sitting there for hours and then I would just take one way and I was like, well, that's stupid. So eventually you understand that if the wave comes, you have two seconds to make a decision. You have to take it and then whatever happens. It's the same with inspiration and I think you should really, the, the difference between people who are doing cool things and not doing cool things it's not, not those who are, they're not better than you anyhow, they're just a little bit quicker and they're also not afraid to fall down or be awkward or fail in a way because this is the biggest thing, you know, you're not taking something because you're afraid of failure, that's at least me. Practice being completely present. I mean, this is something that probably we hear all the time all day, every day, from every source of media that we have. Now everyone is very wise on Instagram, everyone's meditating um, and doing some sort of practice. The thing is, if you meditate once a month, it doesn't work. So practice being completely present is probably one of the most important practices that I found for myself. And um, what it means is, you know, I tried once to surf and take pictures at the same time because those are my two passions and I thought, yay, great, I'm gonna do both. So what happened is, first I got caught up in the white water and if you've ever been to the ocean or to, to big water, you know that the caught up in the white water means that you're feeling basically that you're in a 
tumble dry washing machine and it's, it's not fun there. And the second wave that I got, I lost my GoPro. So <laughs> I stopped chasing that <laughs> multitasking thing. And this means that. So if you do one thing, do it. Um, what helps me to be more present and what helps me to be more present when I'm very excited or exhausted or have 10 hundred tasks or five people asking me questions. I just focus on the breath. This is something that you don't have to buy. It doesn't cost anything. You don't have to download an app. You don't have to know a technique. It's there. You're breathing every day, every minute. You just watch the inhale and the exhale for like two minutes, even 10 seconds. It will send to you forever and it doesn't cost you anything. The next one. <laughs> um, meditation now has a lot of speculation about meditation. I don't, I don't think that everyone should sit in a Buddha pose and meditate. If it doesn't work for you, don't force yourself. It can be running, it can be dynamic meditation. Basically, what meditation means is just, again, being 100% in whatever you do. If it's knitting, if it's talking to your parents, it doesn't matter. Just find that one thing that you do for yourself. And introspective activity, what it means is that um, you have to stay with yourself. You have to see who you are and what you want. Because, and you also have to understand why do why, why do you want to get in the flow? Why do you want to self hack? Or why why do you want to do these things? Because if you don't understand those things, none of this actually will make sense. You will get more exhausted, and you will get um, you will not get anywhere. And the last thing I want to say is that. Um, what I mentioned before, the flow state is not something you get. It's not something you can do with exercise and anyone who's doing any kind of sports knows if you miss two or three weeks of practice, you're kind of back at zero, right? So it's the same thing. You have to practice every day. And the key thing here is that and this is, I'm a very sort of maximalist person, so I say, okay, I'm gonna meditate every day. So if I'm not meditating third day, I'm like, okay, I failed. And one thing that helped me to sort of trick this is that, okay, you miss one day, but then the fourth day you do it again. And then you miss one week, but you don't, you don't stress yourself about being unproductive or uh, unhappy or something like that. You say, okay, that happened already, I can, I can start again. And the start again thing and the start again attitude probably is something that is the most important thing in life. And I want to show you, um, because Flo is also, when I was preparing the presentation, I made one project which kind of is Flo for me, and we did it for, is it already three, two years ago? Three? Three, oh my god. It was three years ago, and, and we, uh, I made this video for Austrian Tourist Board with two beautiful dancers in contemporary museums. Yeah, let's just watch it. And one thing I recently tried and inspired by this video, if you want to really feel what flow is, just get a mask and try to dance in, with closed eyes. But don't do it at home, you can smash things. <laughs>